for that introduction. That was exciting. <laughs> and made me sound great. I love it. Um, all of us, but seriously, I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed my time here in Nebraska, my first time at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, I got to see a lot of things and, and um, your lovely art gallery, which we're in, and, um, uh, and I really appreciate, appreciate everything everyone's done to make me feel welcome, putting me on the radio, having me give praise or, or uh, uh, previews of what I'm about to say, so I feel like I've already given this talk a few times today. Um, I want to thank um, Angel, Marco, Roland, Jeanette, Carrie, Leanne, and uh, communication and English departments who I know uh, put a lot of energy and, and money uh, into making this, this possible and um, without them and, and um, a lot of other people this couldn't have happened. So, thank you. Okay, we'll wait for that. <laughs> so, um, being the inaugural speaker of the Post-Truth series this year, I thought it would be a good idea to get start uh, my talk uh, called The Rhetoric of Sanctuary in the post -truth Era by talking about post-truth, right? To give a sense of kind of where I'm coming from in terms of my understanding of post-truth. So, um, so let's begin with that. Uh, post-truth is a particularly clever rhetorical strategy with the potential to sway public opinion on a variety of social issues. Post-truth rhetoric can be characterized as assertions of commonsensical claims or the refutation of even well-evidenced claims without the accompaniment of traditionally accepted and expected evidence or logic. Such claims or refutations appear to rely on the possibility that, even if unlikely or counterintuitive initially, the fact that assertions have the potential to be true makes them more believable. The popularity and believability of such claims and refutations also may rest on the surprising or shocking nature of their contention. Indeed, the fact that the audiences may not have heard such arguments before, or that such arguments appear on first blush to be apocryphal, may, in fact, make them more credible. After the Oxford Dictionaries proclaimed um, post-truth its International Word of the Year in 2016, Wikipedia now has an entry for post-truth politics. The entry, which does not give a timeline for the origination of post-truth, but implies it is a relatively recently coined phrase or concept, reads post-truth post politics, also called post-factual politics, and post-reality politics is a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion disconnected from the details of policy and by the repeated assertion of talking points to which factual rebuttals are ignored." End quote. Our current era of post-truth may seem new, but it also reignites a classic um, debate, uh, a divide, between those of the Platonic and Socratic school and those of the school of the Sophists. A divide scholars sometimes suggest boils down to the difference between philosophy and rhetoric. In other words, post-truth is much like what rhetoric was in the Gorgias, knackery, with the appropriate counter to post-truth being, of course, facts, logic, reasoning, evidence, which non-rhetoricians usually categorize as falling into the realm of philosophy. Rhetoricians, however, have a particular role to play in such matters, for they are and have been since classical days the shepherds of contingent truths, uncertainties, and probabilities. In rhetoric, truth claims are never guaranteed. Arguments have to be ever won, and audiences require mobilization, <coughs> remobilization, and re-remobilization. Rhetoricians know that in order to win an argument, new strategies have to be used, and that no one has access to fundamental, essential, uh, forever truth. They understand that truth is fickle, and so are audiences. Truth changes over time, and discourses both animate and constitute identities and truths. Politics is ever-changing. Revolutions are uh, not... Uh, Revolutions are not pictures on a huge military ship with gargantuan banners declaring mission accomplished. <laughs> no, revolutions are not fleeting momentary events, mere blips in a long durée. 
uh, oh, rhetoricians understand that an argument may have adherence for an instant, a day, or a decade, but that one should never get too comfortable with anything appearing to be etched in stone. Rhetoric is, after all, ephemeral. It is not enduring. It is not a forever thing. If you came to this talk expecting me to tell you what facts to use to counter post truth, as a rhetorician, I can tell you that I know of an old logic store down the road that sells a wondrous truth elixir. <laughs> In this talk, I will discuss post-truth further, as well as its relationship to race. Then, more specifically, I'll discuss the way post-truth discourse has characterized the contemporary sanctuary movement. This talk thinks through the idea of sanctuary and its potential usefulness in the post-truth era. Finally, I argue that in such times, we need to explore concepts such as sanctuary and sanctuary citizenship further in order to understand the possibilities of freedom in the post-truth era. Not only can sanctuary help shield undocumented immigrants from unwanted and unwarranted immigration control and potential violence, but it can also help scholars and students think about freedom outside of the post-truth logics of the state. Indeed, extra-state institutions, such as sanctuaries, make it possible to think about freedom across multiple extra-state institutions transnationally, as well as to imagine freedom as unconnected and hence untethered to the logics and institutions of the state. Even as the state attempts to use post-truth logics to challenge the power of sanctuaries, thinking of sanctuary outside of the national context may help us rethink the very possibilities of truth in neoliberal, proto-fascistic, and post-truth contexts. Okay. By now, we're all very used to post-truth, fake news, alternative facts, and truthiness claims. In his article, quote, our foreign president, Barack Obama, the racial logics of birther discourses, end quote, Vincent Fong <coughs> suggests that the birther movement and Donald Trump before his presidency asserted Barack Obama was a Muslim and uh, from Kenya and did not have a legitimate birth certificate and therefore was not an American, but scandalously became president anyway. Such discourse relies on the possibility <coughs> that Obama's, illeg quote, Obama's illegitimacy could be theoretically possible, if not plausible, end quote. After some success making post-truth claims during his presidential bid, perhaps especially the birther claim, after becoming president, media audiences have been treated to an onslaught of <coughs> Trump's post-truth claims, and it's a very effective strategy. For example, during his first official meeting with leaders in Congress, this is the first meeting with leaders in Congress, he averred that millions of undocumented immigrants had voted, leading uh, him to lose the popular vote. At that same meeting, he also referred to the enormous size of the crowd present for his inaugural, inaugural address, despite well-publicized pictures and testimonials suggesting that the opposite was true. In fact, the audience for his inaugural address was surprisingly small. <coughs> despite the pervasiveness of Trump's use of post-truth, um, uh, of which these are just a few examples, um, thus far, little scholarship has explored the degree to which post-truth rhetoric plays a, played a role in the election of Donald Trump and his successes while in office. Furthermore, um, research has not sufficiently interrogated the post-truth rhetoric of Fox News, of talk radio, of the Tea Party movement, of the alt-right movement, and of contemporary populist movements generally. And I think studies of this rhetoric would be helpful to understanding what's happening today, and hopefully I'll contribute to that. One of Trump's favorite post-truth topoi has to do with race. Besides arguing that Barack Obama was a Muslim from Kenya, he, and this is a list, so be, be prepared. He also said Obama was not a good student, Obama did not work hard, and Obama favored Kwanzaa over Christmas. In their article, Donald Trump's Racism, the Definitive List, Donald Leonhardt and <coughs> Ian Prasad Pilbrick say, among other examples, that a Trump real estate company tried to keep African Americans from renting apartments that Trump's, uh, Trump treated black employees differently and asserted black people are lazy, urged the death penalty against five black and Latino teenagers who had been accused but were later exonerated of the rape of a white woman, 
suggested educated black people have an advantage, referred to Mexican immigrants as criminals and rapists during his presidential campaign, repeatedly drew special attention to a gang primarily made of immigrants uh, named MS-13, claimed or called for a cessation of immigration of Muslims, referred to the judge who ruled on Trump University in terms of his Mexican heritage, and suggested recent Haitian immigrants had AIDS. Trump referred to cities and large numbers of blacks as war zones, and blacks and Latinos as prone to criminality. He has focused inordinate attention on the crimes of people of color, who has suggested that African Americans are unpatriotic, <coughs> not thankful, and lack respect, lack respect, and that Puerto Ricans are ungrateful. He's retweeted tweets of white nationalists and has been reluctant to decry the support of former Ku Klux Klan member um, David Duke. He hired Steve Bannon, who fomented a white nationalist campaign by Bright Art News, uh, supported the campaign of Roy Moore, who talked about the positive aspects of slavery, and also supported Joe Arpaio, the infamous Arizona sheriff who called for the racial profiling of Latinos. He said Mohawk Indians were prone to criminal behavior, uh, questioned the Indianness of Native Americans on reservations, and repeatedly referred to Senator Elizabeth Warren as Pocahontas. What about sanctuary? Uh, where does sanctuary come in here? Well, sanctuary cities are just one of the many objects of Trump's post-truth discourse, including his racialized post-truth discourse. But one that has led to a presidential executive order shaping contemporary U.S. immigration policy. Um, during the 1980s, church leaders in their communities sought to protect Central Americans um, from being deported uh, and gave them sanctuary, and by doing so, transformed them from being refugees to being asylees. Um, in her groundbreaking uh, dissertation on the 1980s sanctuary movement, Susan Bibler Kooten says the original sanctuary movement was a grassroots, quote, a grassroots religious based effort to transport, shelter, and assist undocumented refugees fleeing violence in El Salvador and Guatemala. So, um, oh, and this is Nebraska, so there it is. So, um, in the United States, as Kooten suggests, bringing undocumented people into the U.S. for humanitarian or personal reasons rather than for profit had rarely been punished. So, in the U.S.'s past, it was very common for people to try to protect people who were vulnerable, who had migrated from other countries. Why? Because they were refugees, and they were escaping horrible conditions. Often they, these were war-torn countries, often the people who were leaving those countries had been targeted for, for murder, or imprisonment, or, um, or torture. And uh, the only option they had in life was to leave the place they were to go to another place. And so many people crossed uh, the U.S. Uh, Mexico border and came to came to the United States, right? And so the U.S. created refugee policies precisely for these people to uh, allow them to stay in the United States and to give them asylum until that they could either go back to 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 the countries from which they came once uh, the danger of death had passed, um, or uh, to allow them a way to stay in the United States because going back. Would, would mean they would face this, um, uh, this horror um, again. So historically, the U.S. had protected refugees. Um, what happened was the U.S. government um, decided um, in the 1980s not to grant um, refugee, uh, the appeal for refugee status to uh, Central Americans who were coming to the United States. That is when um, mostly churches started what's called a sanctuary movement and to protect uh, the, this very vulnerable population. <clears throat> Communication scholars have yet to study the rhetoric of sanctuary as a cultural and political movement. This work will help the field of communication explore the various ways that scholarship within the sanctuary movement can theorize sanctuary as a rhetoric of freedom. Communication research about the rhetoric of undocumented immigration is focused on undocumented youth and the construction of DACA recipients as citizens, on undocumented subjectivity, on the effects of immigration legislation on school attendance, on undocumented as a sign of empowerment, on digital media representations of power, on undocumented student-faculty allyship, 
and on how immigrant performances function as knowledge and power. But scholarship has not theorized resistant extra-state activism as a site for the exploration of alternative concepts, uh, conceptions of justice. A Congressional Research Service report in 2009 defined sanctuary jurisdictions by saying that, quote, as a result of a state or local act, ordinance, policy, or fiscal constraint uh, there, that places limits on their assistance to federal immigration authorities seeking to apprehend or remove unauthorized aliens. So the CRS came out with a definition, and what they said was, a sanctuary jurisdiction is a place where people are protecting people from being um, targeted uh, for deportation. Um, Ballotpedia defines sanctuary jurisdictions as, quote, a city, county, or state that has enacted policies that limit local officials' involvement in the enforcement of federal immigration law. Yet, there's really no definition federally of sanctuary or sanctuary jurisdiction. So these are just, the, 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 the sources I'm citing are ones that are guiding people's thinking about sanctuary. Sanctuary became a topic of post-truth for Trump during his campaign to be president. It then came to be a centerpiece of his goals as president. As a result, he ended up saying a lot about sanctuary, which is why I spent so much time uh, here defining it. Among many other things about sanctuary cities, Trump has said in a speech to mayors and sanctuary cities that sanctuary cities are, quote, the best friends of gangs and cartels, end quote. In Phoenix, Arizona, in April of 2016, he said, quote, we will end the sanctuary cities that have resulted in so many needless deaths, end quote. During his speech in New Hampshire, Trump connected the sanctuary cities of Lawrence and Boston, Massachusetts with drug dealing. He said, quote, ICE recently arrested 15 MS-13 gang members. These are not good people. These are bad, bad people, he said. Quote, I'm repeating my call on Congress to block funds for sanctuary cities and to close the deadly loopholes that allow criminals back into our country, end quote. At a gathering of members of law enforcement and California legislators, just a week after encouraging that adult immigrants in detention be separated from their children, Trump referred to a California sanctuary law as, quote, deadly and unconstitutional. On December 9, 2017, during the week, his weekly address, Trump said, quote, our cities should be sanctuaries for Americans, not for criminal aliens. During a roundtable discussion with California leaders on sanctuary cities, Trump said about MS-13 gang members, quote, you wouldn't believe how bad these people are. These aren't people. These are animals. On 4-18-18, um, Trump tweeted, so many sanctuary areas want out of this ridiculous, crime-infested, and breeding concept, end quote. In another speech on March 15, 2018, Trump said, in recent days, San Francisco officials denied ICE's request to turn over criminal aliens uh, with a prior conviction for battery and, ch and, ch and a charge for driving under the influence, end quote. Hence, from, from, from before Trump was president until now, he has emphasized the criminality of undocumented migrants and, um, uh, at, and of sanctuary locations as uh, dens of uh, criminality. Of course, while these links are strange to me, I don't really understand the links that are drawn. <coughs> he asserted a connection among undocumented immigrants, criminality, drug abuse, uh, gangs, and sanctuary cities. And of course, there's no evidence in any of this, so those who are looking for that won't find it. But after this discourse, what, what this was was a, a PR campaign that, um, that Trump was a part of to prepare for a series of executive orders that once he became president, he would then um, uh, in, try to institute. Following this PR campaign, focusing on sanctuary cities and building his wall, on his fifth day on the job, Trump unsurprisingly released one of two immigration executive orders, Executive Order 13768, penalizing sanctuary jurisdictions that do not comply by withholding federal funds and or exacting funds against them. Further, the executive order stated, quote, sanctuary jurisdictions across the United States willfully violate federal law in an attempt to shield aliens from removal from the United States. These jurisdictions 
have caused immeasurable harm to the American people and to every fabric of our republic, end quote. So again, there's no evidence here. It's unclear what it is that is wrong with sanctuary uh, jurisdictions. The executive order goes on to say, quote, we cannot faithfully execute the immigration laws of the United States if we exempt classes or categories of removable aliens from potential enforcement, end quote. Rhetorically, Section 5 of the executive order stacks the deck with enthymematic claims that strongly imply criminality among undocumented migrants, but contains no data of such, uh, to support such assertions. The order encourages fear of um, criminality and uses language emphasizing, quote, the public safety threats associated with sanctuary jurisdictions. And I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but basically it, it just over and over repeatedly um, <coughs> implies that uh, these sanctuary locations are places where crimes take place. Lawsuits, understandably, followed this executive order, including the city and county of San Francisco versus Trump, and the city of Chelsea versus Trump. The city of San Francisco countered um, this executive order with the support of the state of California. In April of 2017, a federal court issued a preliminary injunction to stop enforcement of the executive order. And on November 21st, 2017, Judge William Warwick III declared it was unconstitutional. And here's why it's unconstitutional. So the Constitution gives the right of states to determine um, how, um, uh, how it will police um, its jurisdictions, all right? And the federal government has limited access to the policing of local areas, states, counties, um, uh, and cities. And so when Trump said that he would withhold federal support <coughs> to states or cities or counties or jurisdictions that you have sanctuaries, he was in effect violating um, the right of cities to, and states to do that themselves. <coughs> So Trump's appeal of the decision uh, uh, of this decision reached the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which which vacated the executive order and argued that separation of powers and the role of Congress to control the spending of federal funds meant the order was unconstitutional. As of August 2017, 32 of the nation's largest 100 cities are are sanctuary cities uh, or have sanctuary policies. These jurisdictions rejected more than 17,000 ICE requests to gain custody of immigrants in the 19 months ending September 2015. Another statistic is provided by Ramirez, who states, quote, estimates provided by the Immigration Legal Resource Center suggest that four states, 365 counties, and 39 cities have policies that to some degree limit their cooperation with requests from ICE to hold immigrants in detention. Well, in Nebraska, there are no sanctuary cities. Sarpy County, which is Nebraska's third most populous <coughs> county, just below, uh, which is geographically just below Omaha, and Hall County, Nebraska's fourth most populous county, which is the home of Grand Island, are sanctuary counties. So in Nebraska, there are sanctuaries. While not de jure exempt from immigration enforcement, churches play a particular role. We're talking about cities and counties and states, um, but also churches play a really important role as they did in the original sanctuary movement of the 1980s. They are often de facto shield, they, they shield immigrants from such enforcement. Moreover, while churches are not exempt, um, immigration and customs enforcement agents have generally left church property alone while pursuing immigrants in the United States. Additionally, on, on uh, at ICE, um, you know, which, which, which is the Immigration Control uh, Enforcement Agency, um, wrote a memo that acts as policy for ICE. And what they say in the memo is, you know, officers are not supposed to go into churches or schools uh, to uh, go after uh, immigrants unless there is um, uh, some kind of warrant or an arrest of a particular person for a particular crime. And the crime more cannot be just like stealing or something like that. It has to be um, something that rises to the, to, to the level that it would justify going into uh, one of those spaces. OK. So I want to talk a little bit about the rhetoric of sanctuary citizenship, which is the primary uh, focus of, of, of this paper. We 
we've talked about sanctuaries, we've talked about post-truth. And we've talked about post-truth rhetoric about sanctuaries. Um, and what, what, what I'm arguing in this paper is that rather than what revolutions have done in the past, which is argue against um, untruths, right? So we know that a lot of what's been said about sanctuaries is untrue. So we could spend all of our time saying, pointing out the errors and saying, in fact, that is true. But in this era of post-truth, it doesn't make sense simply to counter arguments that are post-truth arguments, arguments we disagree with and can find evidence to disprove. Because even when we have those arguments, that doesn't change the political um, uh, Argue, or the political uh, sense of reality, right? It doesn't actually do anything to, to change the politics. So part of what I'm advocating here is rather than spend all of our time and attention doing that, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I mean, that's a fine thing to do, and I can see that it could have um, political positives. But rather than do that, I think we should spend time thinking about sanctuary. Because isn't it odd that we have this Thing that happens in the United States called sanctuary, where people can be protected from being um, uh, 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 from being um, captured and then being imprisoned, and it's an extra legal and outside of national law, but it's something that national and federal law respects as something as something that is allowed to be done, right? And morally. And ethically, I think it makes sense to us. When there's a vulnerable population that is escaping um, sure death, we, as compassionate people, feel that we, sh we should do something and something should be done to protect that class of people. And so there's this ethical, moral component to the whole issue of sanctuary, which seems to override the legal arguments to imprison people who are thought to be undocumented. And, and therefore, I think this is a really important kind of place to, to kind of think about uh, freedom and what freedom can be and how law works in relationship to freedom and how things actually work in the United States because we know of many different kinds of instances in which morality and ethics did prevail over, over the, the kind of factual um, law, right? And so, and I don't like these uh, facile um, analogies between different kinds of social conditions, but one of the common uh, comparisons that's made between sanctuary and other uh, uh, ethical, um, compassionate efforts is the Underground Railroad, right? And so the Underground Railroad, people worked against the law to um, uh, help um, people who were enslaved in this country leave uh, slaving regions to go to um, you know, regions that, are, that don't allow slavery. Right? And so that they're not parallel. They're not an, per perfectly analogous. But this is what people invoke when they do make comparisons. And so we know that in the history of the United States, there are these kind of moments and these uh, ways in which people uh, make their feelings and, and, and their care for others <coughs> paramount over um, what they see in the law. So this topic is particularly important contemporarily, I think, of sanctuary. A sanctuary is one response to anti-immigrant and anti-undocumented immigrant policies and discourse. To my knowledge, no research on sanctuary has yet been published in communication journals. Yet, sanctuary is a, an important option for responding to state regulation of immigration and anti-immigrant public discourse. Rhetoric of sanctuary in public discourse is often marked in terms of extra legal means of responding to harsh immigration policies, of defying law enforcement and government, and of promoting further illegality for undocumented immigrants. It is thus a rhetoric that goes beyond merely conducting a critique of domination. This rhetoric is not yet well understood either by scholars or by general readers of public news discourse. Thus, this project, which engages a critique of freedom, is crucial as a way to build this understanding. Sanctuary movement can, be, can help uh, protect migrants from deportation. An ethic of interdependence, pointing toward humane treatment, 
and humanization of migrants can be crafted to create a broader understanding of the power of humanizing narratives and communal support, and also to help communication scholars understand how the discourses uh, circulate to aggregate power via social media, protests, informational meetings, creation <coughs> of model letters for empowerment of DACA and undocumented students, and traditional media attention. Theorizing sanctuary helps scholars move beyond normative conceptions of state-sponsored citizenship, and also can provide an alternative location beyond the nation-state government in which to consider the extra-state power of migrants. Thus, sanctuary as a site inhabited by non-state actors whose census communists across sanctuary sites can allow for the imagining of global sanctuary citizens. So we think of sanctuary citizens, people who are using or living in sanctuaries, living in churches, right, and, and are escaping federal um, uh, surveillance. If we think about these folks as a class of people, and we think about the, the kind of freedom that they're experiencing by not having to be uh, controlled by, by, by the government directly, um, it helps us to kind of think globally about possibilities. Of course, sanctuary is not a utopia or a panacea that can solve all problems relating to immigration, and I'm not attempting to romanticize sanctuary in theorizing it, um, but rather to participate in a critical rhetorical move and performance that challenges, resists, and deflects attention away from post-truth discourses that dominate the popular imagination. Additionally, there are many and complex ways a church, as a symbol of religion, for example, conditions and limits possibilities for liberatory subjectivities. I'm very aware of that when it, became, when it becomes a location of sanctuary. Nevertheless, migrants can imagine differently by embodying an ontology that sanctuary elicits, and that ontology differs from state-centered controlled notions of migrant citizenship. To put a fine point on this, one, whereas the movement of migrants under states centered and controlled systems of migration is heavily surveilled, policed, regulated, and controlled, hence producing a kind of permanent terrorism for migrant subjects, and two, whereas the goal for state-sanctioned citizenship may be desired, even if upon gaining citizenship, migrant subjects nevertheless experience second-class citizenship and do not have full informal citizenship. Three, sanctuary allows for the imagining of citizenship beyond the state and beyond state-sanctioned citizenship. Such an approach to theorizing sanctuary citizenship provides an alternative to the way citizenship has historically been theorized. Normative ways of thinking about citizenship have centered the migrant subject's relationship to the state, for example, government, ICE, border patrol, homeland security, and police. Freedom means escape from control. Thus, an articulation of citizenship that is dependent upon state actors and institutions uh, necessarily impacts the possibilities for what a citizenship can be. If we think of our freedom and our citizenship and what makes us human and, and unique and what, what is possible uh, in this life, only in terms of the government and what the government does in relationship to us, that is a necessary limitation on what freedom can be. For instance, citizenship is often theorized in terms of a desired future normative participation by subjects in societies inhabited by citizens. Such an approach um, assumes an assimilationist outcome, one in which the migrant subject becomes, a nor becomes normalized through various colonial processes of incorporation, instruction, and um, uh, socialization. Moreover, within transnational global capitalism, Strong state and corporate pressures can join to produce migrant subjects whose flexibility ultimately is in service to capitalism. Citizen subjects who, mu uh, who must be led are rhetorically infantilized by the state, according to Berlant. Furthermore, even if migrants lack economic power within a state-centered conception of migration, migrants nevertheless experience coercion to become economic and cultural subjects within uh, whatever locale they happen to inhabit. So this talk seeks to displace this kind of presumptive model of citizenship that privileges economic capital, mobility, and legal status for those who are denied them within the US nation state. Elsewhere, I've discussed Asian American transnationalism, where citizenship contains both formal and informal 
privileges, and I should stop to kind of talk about that just for a moment. By formal citizenship, I'm talking about what you are allowed to do formally, legally, as a result of being a citizen. So if you reflect for a moment on what freedoms do you get from being a citizen of the United States if you are a citizen of the United States, or if you're not, what citizens of the United States uh, freedoms, uh, what citizens of the United States, uh, what freedoms they get. If you think about that for the moment, you know, it, it's the right to vote, right? It's the right to own property. It's a right to, to avoid certain kinds of paperwork uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, drive a car, uh, to, to do a variety of things. Um, those, that's formal citizenship. That's citizenship that's guaranteed to you by law. And as a, as a result of you becoming a citizen, you get to do these things. But I think that's a very narrow and limited concept of citizenship. And I don't think that's really the full picture. What I talk about is informal citizenship. And that has to do with privileges. That has to do with how you're treated. So if someone gets to say whatever they want, and know, and even when people critique them, uh, they still get to do what they want, right? That's a kind of informal citizenship. It is not guaranteed by law. It is not guaranteed formally. But it is a privilege that that person experiences as a result of a certain kind of citizenship. So we've been becoming, we've begun talk, to talk about this realm of citizenship, the citizenship that is not guaranteed by law, but in fact is a kind of set of privileges that allows some people, for example, to drive a car and not be surveilled constantly by people uh, outside the car, and some people to drive a car and to never be surveilled uh, by people outside of the car. That is a different kind of citizenship. That is a very powerful form of citizenship, and we don't talk about that in terms of citizenship. But if we are all citizens, then we should all have access to the same kinds of benefits, the same kinds of privileges, the same kinds of experiences. And what I'm saying is, what, we spend too much time talking about formal citizenship and not enough talking about informal citizenship, and that's really what I'm getting at here. So, um, this is not unlike what Bourdieu calls cultural capital. Much research on citizenship foregrounds issues like formal citizenship, whereas only in the last decade or so has significant attention been paid to informal citizenship by people like, you know, Giorgio Gamba, Lisa Caccio, Mimi Wynn, and so forth. As an example of informal citizenship, <coughs> even if a migrant gains legal citizenship, they may still be forced to live in racially, economically segregated sections of the city in which they live, places where police do not protect, but rather surveil, terrorize, arrest, incarcerate, and kill. And yet, those with the most informal citizenship are worthy of police protection, whether or not they have formal citizenship, which is interesting. You don't have to have formal citizenship in order sometimes to gain maximum informal citizenship. So in fact, law does not guarantee informal citizenship. That is an elective condition. Investigating informal citizenship, like investigating sanctuary, is a powerful tool for discussing freedom extranationally. Gaining freedom away from the nation state's power and control to regulate migration by invoking and relying on religious power is an interesting community tool that dates back at least 40 years. By community tool, I mean the strategic process by which church organizations, cities, uh, states, and counties um, activate sanctuary as a performance of collective moral backing for undocumented people and in order to showcase the forfeiting of criminalizing narratives within a contemporary politics concern, concerned with illegal migration. Um, and I learned while I was here that apparently there was an ICE raid on um, a, a town, a small town, an urban a uh, suburban, no, not suburban, a rural uh, area of Nebraska, um, just not that long ago. And approximately a thousand ICE agents descended on this, this region, which was a tomato. Was, a what? It was O'Neill, Nebraska. 
O'Neill, Nebraska, it was at a tomato packing plant, uh, and 300 uh, uh, people were, uh, were detained. What, what struck me about this is that the city of, in, in, various, uh, uh, in, in various instantiations, when ICE has come into this state to uh, go after undocumented uh, migrants, uh, people in the state have, uh, by and large, fought on behalf of immigration. And there's an article um, in a local newspaper that talks about the pro-immigration culture of Nebraska currently and how Nebraska is kind of on the precipice of doing something more formal uh, to resist to resist uh, ICE, uh, ICE descending on cities and on people uh, to, to detain them. Uh, and I think this whole area is really interesting because when you're talking about a mass number of people who are resisting federal policy or guidelines or actions, we're talking about something kind of real here, something kind of important. It's happening in Nebraska. It's happening in my home state of Utah. Um, uh, the, the police chief in Utah came out and said, we don't have, we're not a sanctuary, but we're not going to go into neighborhoods to look for undocumented people. And we're not going to help anyone do that. <laughs> wow. So that's where rhetoric is going right now, right? We could call that post-truth. But I think that's really interesting. We are not going to call ourselves a sanctuary city, but we are basically going to act precisely like people who call it, or you know, cities that call themselves sanctuary cities, right? We're not going to help the federal government arrest uh, for no cause undocumented people. By creating sanctuary and making sanctuary publicly known, the sanctuary subject is collectively supported by uh, the people who create the sanctuary. The sanctuary subject is also reconstituted as having a good moral character. So there's a way in which we go in the defense to support undocumented people by standing up for sanctuary. Furthermore, immigration enforcers are deterred from capturing and deporting migrant subjects. In an era of post-truth, then, exploring the possibilities, theoretically unpractical, of sanctuary may be more successful than engaging in a back-and-forth argument countering every post-truth discourse, uh, discourse's errors or logics, illogics. Theorizing sanctuary and sanctuary citizenship might make it possible to constitute migrant subjectivity in both formal and informal terms, to resist normative conceptions of migrants, free, migrant freedom, and to capture a purpose for the humanities. Thank you. Godmer, and then, you know, we made, made our way forward and read Althusser, 
Um, and, and, and then we got to Foucault, okay, and we saw the transition from Foucault as a structuralist to a post-structuralist, and then we read Derrida and Kristeva and Sixu and Eregorai, and then we got, you know, we got to um, uh, Leotard, okay, and then we went from Leotard to, I don't know, Agamben, and then, uh, that's my time. Um, and then, you know, we moved forward to uh, Badu, and we, we've kind of thought through that this lineage is, I think, in a lot of ways, a result of a kind of fear of creeping fascism, fear that fascism is going to come back. And so a lot of our theory about freedom has been in the service of um, kind of resisting or challenging or preventing or, or even a hint of a kind of fascistic tendency. And so, um, you know, I think we're always on the, uh, you know, aware of this. But I, I did read a, a few essays about, about Trump, which were kind of fun to read, you know? <laughs> like, it, it, articles about all, all his failures so far. Like, he hasn't gotten everything he's wanted, you know? And so, so it, like, comparing a fascist society to what's happening today. And, and so fascism, you know, it took about a year. And then it was a complete police state. And it was being run by just a few people. Here, you know, he's being resisted left and right. Like, they're, they're, he's losing a lot of different struggles. And so it was kind of fun to read uh, from my perspective to, to see, like, not everything is, like, going bad. Um, a lot of things are going bad. And, and people all tell me every day it's, like, uh, uh, they're depressed. And I understand that very well. But um, I think to say that post-structuralism has caused it, I don't know. I don't know. I'll think on that. Thank you. I was. I wanted to return your comment about the um, push against uh, ICE or crackdowns on illegal immigration in yeah. Nebraska, and I, I, I hope to see the day that Nebraska takes formal steps <laughs> yeah. to protect people. Right. I don't think we're there under current yes. um, state uh, politicians and political leadership, but. I think in Nebraska, where you see it, are in localized um, places with high immigrant populations, like Crete, Nebraska, for example, mm -hmm. and a lot of the um, protective kind of sanctuary activity is coming out of public schools, mm -hmm. and the people who work with children yes. and want to protect the children in those communities. Yes. And, I, and I wanted to suggest that I have seen something else in Nebraska, which is an almost anti-sanctuary movement, anti-sanctuary city movement. Okay. For example, Fremont, Nebraska, and Scribner, Nebraska, about an hour and hour 20 minutes from here, have each undertaken local ordinances to crack down on undocumented immigrants, specifically by requiring positive proof of legal status to rent a place to live mm -hmm. in the city. So I, I, yeah. I'm concerned about fascism, too, and I think you yes. can trickle up. Yes. And so you can have these pockets yeah. of people that are pushing back against um, you know, places even two hours down the road where they see per humane protection being extended that can be described. That's great. Thank you for, for that. That's, uh, I think that's a very good uh, temper to kind of like some optimism that you see going yeah. on this talk. <laughs> I'm really yeah. described that way, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All the way up there. Yes. Um, do you think it would be beneficial then to just national uh, the federal government to have open borders? Because it seems to me that there's a disconnect where immigrants come in and they say that they're undocumented, but in doing that, that is a criminal act. So then they are inherently criminals. So the only way to reverse that then would be to have open borders, and then coming in here being undocumented would no longer be a criminal activity. Yeah, I mean, I think, thank you for the question. I think this is this is a very. I think if we think about it for a little bit longer, it becomes a kind of complex issue because for people who are struggling to survive, um, they're desperate. They're desperate people. They'll do anything. Um, I think most. I don't know how many people in the room have uh, siblings or um, have children, have, have parents, but. People will do extraordinary things to help their family members, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if 
you are being pushed out of your country if, if there's a threat to your child, if there's a threat to your sister, if there's a threat to your grandmother. Um, what would you do um, to protect them? Uh, obviously, you wouldn't try to harm someone else. Like that's We work really hard not to do that. But would you leave the place that is the threat to your family member, even though you might be arrested in the place you go. I ask you that. So, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots. <coughs> Absolutely. And you know, part of my talk is about, like, we do a lot to support our laws, okay? And laws are really important. <coughs> At the same time, morality and ethics and compassion and care and support and humanity plays a very, very significant role in what we do, too. Law plays a role in what we do, but also this other, this other part plays a big, a big role. And, and they don't often meet, or they don't always meet. Uh, sometimes they're actually counterposed. Sometimes there's, there's a real contradiction. Right? And so that's kind of what I'm trying to highlight here, that, you know, yes, I agree that there, there are these laws, and yes, it, you know, police will descend on people who cross, cross the border, you know, without proper papers, right? Um, or at the wrong time, or at the wrong place, or, you know, with the wrong people, or whatever. But it's also true that, you know, when we find out why they're leaving, where they're going, that might change our view, that might change the way that we think about what they're doing. Thank you. Yes? Uh, so, you just mentioned morality, and yes. uh, a few times in your uh, talk, we bring up uh, sanctuaries in the form of churches. And I, I would like to pose a question to you, uh, how the combination of morality and religion in this country are being used to sort of, uh, are being weaponized against identities, um, particularly in the form of Islamophobia, but also in racism in general, yeah. and how, how we can reconcile those two realities. Yeah, I don't, you know, there's a part in the talk that I give today in which I say that, you know, there are certain conditions that churches being a kind of site of sanctuary necessarily impose on the possibilities for freedom. And so I'm aware that that's there, and that I'm not obviously not spending too much time on it today. But um, it does raise for me an issue, though. You know, when, when in the 1980s, it was churches that were taking a political stance, right, and doing so against what they understood the law to be, <laughs> in order to um, uh, be compassionate. So what does it mean in our society when churches are the ones taking that stand that's, and, and able to do so? I think that's an intriguing uh, notion. So, so regardless of all of the other kind of uh, conditions that churches might create uh, in relationship, as you said, to identities, right, in terms of uh, kind of like a violent assault on um, uh, different identities, let's say. How is it that in this kind of moment in the 1980s and now, the church has kind of jumped out into the forefront and takes stances that the rest of us can't seem to pull together to do, right? So, so we kind of think about, if you have a problem and you want to change something, you work together uh, with your neighbor, you go down to the city council and you, end, you, know, you kind of get your representative or you yourself might propose something and then it's debated and then it might happen, right? Churches seem to be able to just kind of do this thing. They don't, they don't necessarily need this kind of process and this process doesn't seem to be working as well or as effectively as this other one. So I, I just think it's interesting to explore and to think about um, and to question, and, and I think it's a bit question ourselves, you know, like, you know, if, if we do care about this, you know, and we are critical of, of some things that some churches do, um, why aren't we able to be more effective at, at doing the work that churches are doing? Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Uh, there are a lot of hands now, so <laughs> you'll have to help me. If, if you had your hand up for a long time, can you keep it up? Uh, go, go ahead. Do you have your hand up? Yeah. I, you have two fingers. So Sorry, Councilman. Go for it. Um, you mentioned earlier in this, 
pretty early and talked about it, uh, when discussing like post truth stuff, a lot of times even when you present evidence to the contrary, um, they, it usually still doesn't have any effect on that's right. To, um, you know, suppressing it. Yeah. So when in classical argumentation and rhetoric, you know, providing evidence and facts is how you dispute it. If this is inspected, how how do you combat it? That's right. And so 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 if I'm an argument scholar or I'm a journalist, and I'm sorry for philosophers. And if I'm a philosopher, you know, and I'm not a rhetorician, I might think all you can do is bring the facts forward and show how people are being misled by the wrong information. You're right. I don't think that's working. I see that every day, and I think that's CNN's primary rhetorical strategy, is to combat this with evidence, you know, or sometimes not evidence, with more posters sometimes. Um, <laughs> As a rhetorician, I'm like, I'm up for the challenge, right? This is a new rhetorical, maybe it's not new, but it's a rhetorical approach that challenges our perception of how people become convinced, right? They're not becoming convinced by the facts, even when presented with them. Even with the preponderance of evidence, that is not working. So as a rhetorician, I'm like, what rhetorical move could be effective? How do we think about rhetoric in the era of post truth? So this, I just repeated you said. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you just have to do something a little different. So in this case, what I'm saying is there's a lot of post truth out there about sanctuary, false information about the criminality of places. And there's actually people out there. Uh, there's this guy, uh, his last name's Wong, and I think he's at UC, one of the University of California uh, universities, and he's a researcher, kind of a, a political scientist, sociologist type. And he's doing research to show, and, and that has shown, that uh, sanctuary uh, jurisdictions have less crime than jurisdictions outside of the sanctuary. Okay? I applaud that, yay, for him, you know, because that's awesome, and that might work. But it doesn't seem to be working. What, you know, what I'm saying, it doesn't seem to be working. I want him to keep doing that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I think we don't actually know a lot about sanctuary. What is it? If we explore it, what do we learn about ourselves? I think you know, what I'm trying to say is, by exploring it, what I've learned about humans is that sometimes compassion requires thinking outside of the law. And the sanctuary is a way to do that, right? And so when we have law against morality, who's going to win? And like under what conditions? So this seems to be a time to really think about that. And to maybe say, yeah, we've made laws and they worked for us and they're, they're still really important. But sometimes we just don't think the law addresses what we need uh, to happen as a society. And so you see these kind of social things happening, right? These extra legal things. So my city of... Of, of Salt Lake City, <laughs> the, the leaders of the city say, we're not going to help anybody go after undocumented immigrants, but we're not a sanctuary city. <laughs> we're not a sanctuary city, but we're not going to help. But we're not a sanctuary city. So there's like compassion going on and law at the same time. These are the, these are the people who are protecting the law. Saying this, right? So that, we need to think about that. I think it helps. Yes. Yes. Um, so, something that I find really, really interesting about this talk as a whole is how positive it is. Yeah. Um, in in an era where it's not, we're not just post truth. We're also kind of post any kind of optimism. Yeah. I think many of us are post any kind of optimism because yeah. we're shielding ourselves with this cynicism in order to sort of deal. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm I'm curious about this sort of rhetoric that is for something, so you're yeah. discussing for, um, discussing sort of the positive elements of sanctuary rather than the negative elements of immigrants, right? Um, but I feel like sort of we've seen over the past century since political campaigning started that sort of the longer we do political campaigns, the more any kind of political discussion needs to be negative. It's, all, it's now sort of attack ads are the thing. Right? Yeah. That's, that's Trump's whole thing, is attacking, attacking, attacking. So I guess, 
how do we sort of change, how do we approach rhetoric to, that changes that mindset towards we should be listening to the positives, we should be listening to the sort of the, the things that are good about certain things yeah. rather than just looking at all of the attacks on everything else. Thank you for the question. Okay, so I'll just tell you where my brain goes. And then I realized that that's where my brain was in this talk. Um, in in Homi Baba's uh, dis discussion of uh, the stereotype, um, one of the things he talks about is the fact that a, a colonial subject, someone who's been colonized, when faced with a colonizer. So a colonizer, in order to colonize, has to kind of dehumanize and has to kind of objectify a subject, right? So the subject becomes objectified as a, a kind of, um, uh, as an object. And that, that object, by becoming an object, then can be um, controlled and, and uh, dominated and made to do things. But he says that uh, the person who's colonized knows that the colonizer doesn't really know them. Only the colonized knows the colonized. The colonizer only sees what they see in a kind of um, a refracted sense, right? in, a, in a kind of very limited perspective, right? And so what he says is the potential for resistance here is that the colonized person knows far more about themselves and who they are than the colonized ever can. And that, that can be used strategically, that can be used uh, in a resistant way. And so I think my brain actually was, thank you again for the comment, because I think my brain was actually going to that way of thinking. That if we spend time actually thinking about sanctuary and, and how odd it is that this exists within our society, that people are actually doing this, that there are these spaces that we don't really talk about that are happening, right? Just three or four blocks from my house, there's a sanctuary church that I know the people living inside, right? And these are, they're living every day in, in the church and they're out of um, uh, surveillance of, of uh, the police. Now the police may be monitoring them, like, I don't know, but they're not going into the church. And I think, wow, we just haven't thought about that very much. You know, in a way, we're hearing all of these stereotypes of what a sanctuary is, and they're wrong-headed, we know that. So clearly the people talking about them don't know what they are. So maybe what we should do is figure out what they are. What is their purpose? What are they there for? Why do people care about them? Why would people do something so radical as to shield people from the law? Like, where, where is the humanity in that, right? So I think that that's, you know, the hopeful part of this is if we learn more about that, I think it can be used against people who know very little about that, right? And, and it's not that we have to show them, like, this is what it is and you don't know what it is, but I think the more you know, the more strategies become available to you for resisting people who have simple ideas about, uh, about things we care about. Thank you for the question. And You're right in the, in the fourth row. You had to hand up a lot. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Immigration reform? Yeah, like how we should deal with the subject. <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. I wish I were like an expert on this. Um, yeah, I really hesitate to like jump in there and give you a solution. I don't really know that, right? Because I'm a person who kind of like thinks historically about before there were nation states. And, you know, people moved. Like, that was really human to move. And let's say, even in the United States, it's very human to move. Many, you probably know people, or you are people who move. <laughs> so, human movement seems to me sort of a given. A little odd is putting lines to prevent people from moving, that's a little odd, but it, that may also be human. So it's like these human things that we do. We naturally move, we're prone to moving, it's only human to move. And maybe it's only human to want to stop people from moving too. 
Um, so, so, so we kind of kind of reconcile this. So um, the the, the um, question earlier, an earlier question about should we open up the borders? Well, before there were borders, that's what people did. They just moved from one, from one place to another. These borders happen over time, and now we're pretty committed to them. A lot of us. Um, so if you ask me, like, what should happen with immigration policy? Um, I think we should really think carefully about the planet and who gets to move where and when and why we feel so strongly that some people can move and some people can't. That doesn't sound like policy, does it? Yeah. Um, Marco? Ron. 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 Yeah, I was a little surprised that you didn't really interrogate the word sanctuary very much. I mean, okay. sanctuary means holy, it means around the around the altar, it means in different religions, it's got different meanings, yes. but it su suggests a different space that's not sacred, right? It's a, it's a sacred space. Well, citizenship yes. doesn't mean anything in sacred space. There is no sense of national citizenship inside a sacred space, right? Because you're all children of God, or, or whatever the religious belief is, and in such a world, citizenship doesn't it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh -huh. So I think it's interesting that the that the movement uses the word sanction. Yes. Um, comment on that? <laughs> well, I, think, I think your take on sanctuary is interesting. I think that's one conception of sanctuary, right? Um, like there, there are probably, well, there are definitely people who believe in hierarchy within uh, sanctuary spaces. I mean, so some people believe we're all the same equal under, you know, that's a kind of a democratic view of how a particular kind of religion would conceive of uh, the relationship between um, subjects. That's not always the case. Um, that's one. And then two, uh, you know, it's Latin. So I, I, I did look and think about that. And um, there are other uses of sanctuary besides just in a religious frame, but I think this, in this case, it is a religious frame. Uh, but that includes, you know, the protection of infants are often thought of as um, infants are placed in a sanctuary, you know. Um, and maybe that was preconditioned by a, a kind of religious view of sanctuary, too. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that more. But, yeah, thank you. Maybe related to that question, so when I hear sanctuary, maybe I, I can conceptualize it with a level of care, yes. or it seems like that historically is there, yeah. that like you go into a sanctuary and you can expect some level of care. So when you mention that your leaders, uh, your city leaders, um, are navigating the tension between not calling themselves sanctuary, but yet sh providing that shield, is there also a disclosure of an unwillingness to provide care so that they, they're fine benefiting from maybe like the economic benefits that non, undocumented people provide, but they really don't want to commit themselves to a care that would be implied with sanctuary? Yeah, I mean, that could be implied, right? Um, yeah, I hesitate on that because there's so much PR going on about this. Like, a lot of these are very, very strategically PR-related. Like, how can we make sure, and, and this is in that, that district, how can we make sure to keep getting money from the federal government and not uh, be one of those places that Trump says can't have money because we are a sanctuary? So that, that's very much a part of this. So it's, it's strategic in that sense. Um, and yes, I think that discourse doesn't veer in the direction of care. I'm not positive that it means there is no care. And I'm not positive that saying it that way um, is not a way to protect the care that is happening. So people love people. I mean, people love people. And they love, I mean, no matter what their status. And so there are communities that are just torn asunder uh, who, are, who are primarily citizens uh, when undocumented citizens are um, deported. And, and these gut-wrenching stories of communities that are, that are really ripped apart because this happens. It's, so it's not, some of the stories you see are like children, you know, in 
tremendous anguish because their parents have been deported. So there's that. But there are also stories of communities of people who have citizenship <coughs> who cannot believe that this person got taken away. And this is in the history, I think you can see this in the history of, um, of Asia. Uh, and so, you know, when the, the police who have to deal with this all the time, or the, or the, the, uh, <coughs> the mayor who has to deal with this all the time, when these figures are put under a microscope and asked to speak publicly to a newspaper about this, I think that they're um, being pretty careful, not always, but often very careful about how they're, they're saying what they're saying, right? Because they know that they have community members who are listening to what they're, what they're saying. So I'm not, I'm not sure I can necessarily say it's uncaring. Uh, and you're not saying that. So. Thank you. Thank you right over there. Yep. Um, so, I, I'm an international student from Venezuela, yeah. and um, I don't really yet have a formed opinion on American politics. <laughs> okay. um, but what I've seen since I came here, since I came here, is that um, in America there is a very, very polarized society, and people tend to believe that if they believe in one side of, in, in one aspect of a party's. Uh, political opinion, they have to agree with every single other tendency of that party. And I believe that both, wouldn't you say that both sides of the political spectrum in the United States are guilty of using this rhetorical um, strategy uh, post-truth? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, no one has a has rights to, to put post truth or more than the other, yeah, for sure. And I was alluding to that with the CNN comment, by the way. They're using it all the time. I thought you were going to say something different, <laughs> but, which, is, which is something that I was really going to agree with, which is in um, our, our book, John Sloop and I, Shifting Borders, we made the argument that anti immigrant discourse um, is carried out <coughs> by people on the left and people on the right in this country. That's they're they're okay. both guilty of anti-immigrant discourse. Right? And they're different. The discourses are different. But they're, they're very anti-immigrant. Uh, Time for one more question, if there's any. Yes. Would you say, though, that uh, one side uh, weaponizes uh, uh, post-truth or truthiness? Uh, and one calls it out, and so therefore they can't be uh, equivocated? Um, okay, <coughs> weaponizing post-truth. Wow, that sounds like a totally different talk. Um, I just think of Colbert, right? Okay. Like not being, so, you know, Comedy Central and such things, you know, this was all maybe coming up at first. Yeah. And so that seems to be one side exploring, whereas the other side uh, is not. Okay, we, we are not on the same page on this one because I'm a total skeptic of Colbert. Oh, it, I'm, um, I'm not trying to endorse you know, yeah. Colbert in any sort of way. It, it's kind of like Archie Bunker, All in the Family, too. I mean, I think Colbert is All in the Family. Uh, all in the Family, you know, this, this rant by this guy who was racist, he was sexist, he was homophobic, he, you know, he's. You know, anti-poor, pro-American, this guy, and so a lot of people saw that show and thought, "Yeah, that's my dad," and I'm opposed to my dad because this is the '60s and '70s, and I don't agree with that guy. But then they did surveys after the show, right? After the show had aired for a number of years, and found the majority of people who were watching the show supported Archie. And so the early research that I've seen now already on Colbert is he, he's like playing with truthiness, right? And you're supposed to see him kind of as this lefty guy who's, who's posing questions from a leftist perspective, but he's kind of like shrouding it in, in humor. But that's apparently not what audiences are getting. So early kind of um, research on this is showing, in fact, that people actually think he's conservative and they support him. So I, I think it's interesting to use Colbert as an example for it. Because 
website. Um, I don't know what weaponizing is. I, I just wanted to use that word, that word truthiness. Oh, that's what I'm proof aware. Oh, but, but I'm more interested in, in, in Trump, et cetera, using uh, this post truth as a weapon. Yeah. That, that more so than, than the Colbert stuff. Yeah. I don't see like the New York Times when they correct, you know, 2,500 mistruths or whatnot. I know they're doing the one thing, but they're not weaponizing the post truth. They might not be effective in their yes. you know, kind of approach and stuff like that, or the Washington Post, whatever it may be. But one side is stirring up the pot or stirring up, you know, mudding yeah. the waters and then just leaving that mud for other people to, you know, sift through. The, the, the left doesn't seem to be doing that. Okay. That's just um. my... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, if, if you see that difference. Yeah, because you're saying that one side doesn't own the rights. Right? You know, the yeah. Posture. I'll have to think on it. I don't, I don't know for sure. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, I think on this note, we, we should end. Um, first of all, let's give a big round of applause to... Clearly, judging from all the questions that you have, like that, that is hitting a real nerve, the question of truth, right? Again, going back to your comment, this ties back to what you said earlier on, to what extent truth speaking is the right answer to post truth, right? Like where, where there is a disconnect on some level. And our next speaker, Lee McIntyre, that uh, Brion uh, earlier on uh, alluded to, will be here in two weeks, and he will be sort of a defender of a more straightforward version of truth and he will be um, sort of intellectually probably be quite critical of post-structuralism, post-modernism, some of the assumptions that underlie rhetorical theory as, as you have woven into, into your talk. So if you're interested in this, this will be a nice follow-up to this, uh, even if you're not uh, Lee McIntyre is a philosopher, so like a lot, most of you are probably, especially the students here, are probably from Com Studies courses right now, but come out again and sort of see uh, how a philosopher who has thought fairly carefully uh, about the notion of truth uh, and post-truth uh, is going to present uh, his case and sort of how this pairs up with uh, what Professor, Professor Ono has uh, uh, communicated to us today. So, thank you.